think they don't deserve to lose the the game. During the game, you couldn't see who was the the championship champion and the premiership champion. <laughs> it was exactly the same. Many expected their nearest rivals to come from across the capital at Highbury. Plans were well advanced for Arsenal's move to their new 60,000-seat Emirates Stadium at Ashburton Grove. To mark their final season at Highbury, the Gunners returned to the original colours they wore when they first moved to North London. But as they planned to wave goodbye to the marble halls, they faced the reality of doing the same to their captain, Patrick Vieira, who moved to Juventus. In the fight for the Premier League trophy, his departure would be telling. Just a week into the season, the top two teams in the country met at Stamford Bridge. Drogba! He scored! The result set the tone for the season. Arsenal's focus would switch to the Champions League as the campaign progressed. Chelsea's main rival for the title would come from the north. Manchester United finished 18 points off the pace last time out, so the summer takeover of the club by the Glazer family had been an unwelcome and unwanted distraction. United, they certainly were not. American tycoon Malcolm Glazer had paid nearly £800 million for the crown jewels of English football, and the United fans made their feelings known over the summer as distasteful scenes surrounded Old Trafford would arguably the biggest club in the world struggle under the constraints of foreign ownership. Funds had been made available to bolster the squad, with Dutch international keeper Edwin van der Sar joining from Fulham, as well as South Korean midfielder Ji Sung Park from PSV Eindhoven. Phil Neville left Old Trafford for Goodison Park. He didn't have to wait long to be reunited with his brother, though it was another familiar face who wrote the headlines. That defeat was the precursor to a torrid start to the season for the Toffees. The surprise package of the last campaign, they were unceremoniously dumped out of the Champions League by Villarreal before suffering a similar fate in the UEFA Cup at the hands of Dinamo Bucharest. Domestic form was equally woeful for David Moyes' side, who ended the month with a mere three points and a solitary goal to their name. A season that had begun so brightly was rapidly falling apart, as one of the brightest managerial prospects in the country suddenly found himself under pressure. Did the extraordinary events of a balmy night in Istanbul mean that Liverpool were now genuine title contenders? 3-0 down at half-time, the Reds pulled off the most remarkable comeback in Champions League history. It was uh, the perfect game, no? because uh, people say that it's the most exciting game in all the history. Maybe it's true. The most uh, special thing was the, the, the supporters during the game, before the game and after the game. Despite this monumental achievement, the Liverpool fans' celebrations would be short-lived without success at home. It had been 15 years since they won the league. Far too long for a club of their stature. The ability to win the title rested heavily on the shoulders of Steven Gerrard. But with the transfer window about to close, it looked as if the England midfielder would be leaving for Chelsea. Then, in another dramatic turnaround, Gerrard announced he'd stay. I just didn't want to let go of what I've, what I've worked so hard for. I've been to this club since I was eight years of age. I just feel as if the club deserve the next five, ten years of my career. and um, I don't want to give them years to any other football club. I want to give them to Liverpool. It hadn't been such a harmonious start to the season elsewhere. At White Hart Lane, the acrimonious departure of sporting director Frank Arneson to Chelsea left Martin Yole as the sole survivor of the managerial trio who'd taken charge a year earlier. Not that the Dutchman was feeling lonely. I am the man, you know. Why, why shouldn't I be the man? I'm, uh, I'm working with, uh, with the lads. I'm responsible for them. Frank was never interfering with me. He was working uh, with the academy. He was working for me. He was supporting me. And I think that is the role of a sporting director. 
Yol soon made his mark with an array of young faces joining the club and considerably lowering the average age of the squad. But it was an old hand who signalled Tottenham's intentions. Edgar David signed from Inter Milan. He arrived with a reputation for being difficult to manage, but settled in and propelled Spurs to their best ever start in a Premier League season. Defoe. Still it's Defoe! What a terrific goal! Like Spurs, Manchester City have promoted their manager from within following the departure of Kevin Keegan. And Stuart Pearce was rapidly building as fearsome a reputation as a manager as he had as a player. City, under Pearce's guidance, narrowly missed out on Europe last time round. Under his enthusiastic leadership, they were viewed as one of the Premier League's dark horses. A new look strike partnership of Andrew Cole and Darius Vassell paid immediate dividends. City went unbeaten in August, taking 10 points from 12. So this is how the table stood at the end of the month. A 100% record for the champions, Manchester City and Charlton, both off to a flyer. Early days at the bottom, but alarm bells were already sounding in the northeast, with Sunderland and Newcastle slow off the blocks. Morton Gamp's Pedersen's stunning finish rounded off a great Blackburn move to win goal of the month. Darren Bent took the Barclays Premier League Player of the Month, and City's excellent start made Stuart Pearce the top boss. With three wins, Alan Kerbishley's Charlton Athletic started September in third place. Theirs was a significantly strengthened squad, with Alexei Smirtin, Jonathan Spector and Darren Ambrose all arriving to join Darren Bent, who was simply flying. Where Bent led, an inspired Danny Murphy followed to leave Alan Kerbishley in an optimistic mood. I think that we've got the depth that I've been craving for for the last two or three seasons. And if we can get to the challenging position we've been in in previous years, you know, round about March in the top six or seven, we've always fallen away. And, um, you know, I'm hoping that the size of the squad will have a, a, an effect on that this year. The North East have begun the season with high expectations. Sunderland joined Middlesbrough and Newcastle in the Premier League for the first time in two seasons. Graham Souness began his first full year in charge with a trimmed squad. Out went troublesome Craig Bellamy and Lauren Robert, as well as Aaron Hughes, Andy O'Brien and Darren Ambrose. But he was given money to strengthen. Emre arrived from Inter Milan, while Souness put an end to Scott Parker's dismal spell at Stamford Bridge. If the Newcastle fans have been slow to accept their new manager, their views were changed by the arrival of Michael Owen from Real Madrid. It looked odds on the England striker would return to Anfield, but the persuasive powers of Souness and the chance to team up with Alan Shearer in his last season proved too great a temptation. This is a new chapter now and um, I'm really looking forward to it. I've been outside, look, looked around and seen the reception that I've got and I uh, just wish there was a game tomorrow now. It wasn't long before the goals started to flow. Michael Owen finds the net in the black and white for the first time. Neighbour Sunderland had ended their two-year exile from the top flight, promoted after title success in the championship. But from the outset, with little investment in the team and an inexperienced squad, it was always going to be a battle for Mick McCarthy. By the time they faced Middlesbrough at the end of September, they'd picked up just one point from a possible 18. And suddenly there's an opening at the other end, and there's a goal!
<laughs> yes. Feels like I waited years. Uh, no, I haven't. I've waited. Is it seven games we've had now? That's what I've waited. And it's, it's very, very pleasing. It's a nice feeling. Joining Sunderland in the top flight were West Ham. Since taking charge in October 2003, Alan Pardew had struggled to win over the passionate Upton Park fans. 11 points from the first six games helped that. For striker Marlon Harewood, September also proved to be a turning point. Against Aston Villa, he got his first goal since promotion. A striker who'd scored 17 times in the championship, giving a clear message to those who doubted his ability to succeed at the highest level. My goodness, it's all going right for West Ham United, and it's going magnificently for Marlon Harewood. Three for him. Here would claim the first hat trick of the season. To the opposite end of the country, where Blackburn Rovers had made an indifferent start to the season. One win and three defeats in the first six games was nothing to write home about. A return to Old Trafford proved inspirational for Mark Hughes and added to United's difficulties, even if the manager was trying to send out positive vibes. With West Ham making an unexpectedly bright start to the campaign and Sunderland struggling, October saw all eyes turn to the third promoted side, Wigan Athletic. A place more traditionally linked with former Super League champions, the Warriors, Wigan now found itself gripped by football fever. Despite having money to spend, attracting quality players to the JJB proved difficult and a quick return to the championship was expected for Paul Jewell's side. the experts were with seven wins to the start of October Wigan were in European form you ask anyone in the streets of Wigan or the country never mind Wigan if Wigan finish fourth bottom before a ball's kicked they all say that's a magnificent achievement but I don't think they'll do it now we're sitting in second and people are getting uh, delusions of grandeur you've got to keep your feet on the floor give us uh, give us survival and we'll try and kick on the air after but we've got an awful lot to do to make sure we're safe After three seasons in the Barclays English Premier League, Birmingham City looked to have shaped a squad that could progress from last term's 12th place. But October saw them already embroiled in a relegation battle they would fight for the rest of the season. Six points from 33, Steve Bruce was under pressure. 
An injury crisis has denied him the use of key players. Is it Dunn, Upson, Heskey, Cunningham? All linchpins and all unavailable. Yet Bruce remained upbeat despite needing the chairman's vote of confidence. I've got a good relationship with me board. I think that's been on record. Um, but I'm not going to take that for granted. You know, I mean, I put myself under pressure because I don't like being where I am in the league. You've got to try and get through it. Over the last two, three, four years, it's gone one way for us. You know, we've, we've done okay. It's our turn at the moment to, to be under pressure and, and fight the way through it. And it's not enjoyable, um, but it makes you a better manager, that's for sure. Across Birmingham, the feel-good factor following West Brom's remarkable escape the previous season was still evident. The Baggies have become the first team to avoid the drop after being bottom at Christmas. Despite a stronger squad, reality was biting and another relegation battle looming. One of their few highs came against Arsenal. And it's been forced in by Philip Senderos. Senderos only to Cardo! And West Brom are level. Kamara. Also singing the blues down at the bottom with Birmingham and West Brom were Everton. David Moyes endured a humiliating start to the season, leaking goals and more importantly scoring only once in their first eight games. In complete contrast, Chelsea had maximum points from nine games with 23 goals scored and just three conceded. Would a heavy defeat for David Moyes bring the first managerial casualty of the season? The referee has given a penalty kick. 1-0 Everton. And the referee, Mark Blackburn, got in the way, but it fell for Lampard. Oh. oh, and he's finished it. Chelsea's 100% record has gone. Really pleased with the, with the performance of the players. Uh, we had to work hard against a, a great Chelsea team. I think probably the best team in Europe at this present time. And uh, we had some one or two scary moments, but we tried to cause them some as well. Everton's tougher, more determined style meant they've rediscovered the winning formula of last season. The Chelsea game proved to be their watershed. Four wins in their next five games gave them fresh confidence. The champions had finally dropped points but were still nine clear of Wigan. Manchester United and Arsenal had plenty of ground to make up. Everton showing signs of a revival but not yet clear of the bottom three. Liverpool continued to tread water but had games in hand. Matt Taylor's thunderous strike against Sunderland claimed goal of the month. Frank Lampard couldn't stop scoring. He was player of the month. And Paul Jewell collected his second consecutive award. On the 29th of October, Manchester United travelled to the Riverside Stadium to face an out-of-sorts Middlesbrough. What unfolded over the next 90 minutes conspired to change United's season and spelt the end of an era. What a fantastic goal for Great Scumbendieta! And Ferdinand's beaten, and Van der Sar is beaten, and Middlesbrough are two to the good! Yakubu to take the game out of the reach of United. Middlesbrough four, Manchester United nil, and Sir Alex Ferguson is feeling this. It finished 4-1, prompting United captain Roy Keane to lambast his fellow professionals in a now-banned TV interview. Cristiano Ronaldo, Rio Ferdinand and Darren Fletcher came in for particular criticism. Keane had been sidelined at the time due to an injury against Liverpool. He considered the performances in his absence to be unacceptable as United slipped 13 points behind leaders Chelsea. The champions, still unbeaten in the league, were the next to visit Old Trafford. Keane cut an uneasy figure in the stands. Interesting ball. Rooney took it brilliantly. Now Skulls. Ronaldo. Clever. And a good ball in. Fletcher on the far post. It's in! 
Manchester United get the breakthrough. Half an hour gone. Fletcher's first goal of the season. What a moment to score it. What an important goal. Chelsea have been beaten for the first time in over a year in the Premier League. The champions have had their colours lowered and it's happened again in Manchester. King's comments may well have had the desired effect, but he was an increasingly isolated figure at Old Trafford. Perhaps even he, an icon at the club, had overstepped the mark. But it still came as a surprise when United announced the termination of his contract. After a period of contemplation, he moved to Glasgow Celtic. Keane will be remembered as one of the all-time greats, and United's fortunes will be forever linked to his 13-year tenure at the club. Portsmouth's 3-0 defeat at Anfield in mid-November proved to be the last game in charge for manager Alain Perrin. The Frenchman took the Fratton Park job in April 2005, but his record of only four wins in 20 games was the worst in the club's history. Chairman Milan Mandaric has now seen seven bosses leave in as many years. Assistant Joe Jordan once again took over as caretaker manager, charged with lifting a beleaguered squad. A more familiar look to the table come the end of November with the Big Four moving into position. Wigan were still flying the flag for the underdog. Managerless Pompey were in the bottom three and still looking for a home win. Charlton's form had deserted them. After a bright start, they'd slipped into the bottom half. Collins John's wonder strike at the Riverside won goal of the month, while Robin Van Persie stepped out of Thierry Henry's shadow and four wins out of four saw Liverpool's Rafa Benitez rewarded. I'm pleased to tell you to all our supporters, and I know they will be very happy with this announcement. Harry is our manager as of tonight. It was a scene few could have imagined just a week or so earlier. Milan Mandaric introducing Harry Redknapp as Portsmouth's new manager. Pompey would always be special with me. I mean, I, as I said, that two and a half years here, it would have been fantastic for me. Redknapp had left Pompey a year earlier after falling out with his chairman. He quickly took up a new job with the arch enemy Southampton. The relationship between Redknapp and Mandaric seemed beyond repair, but apparently not. We've got to get this place jumping.